The Lord be with you. Well, welcome back to another installment of Nerds of the Words. Uh, this time we are going to pick up uh, in chapter 1 still of 2 Peter uh, verses 10 through 15 today, but just a quick reminder of kind of what we have covered in the first nine verses and how that's going to connect to what comes after it. Uh, so 2 Peter actually begins with a discussion of faith, uh, a faith that the apostles have that's very important because they knew Jesus. It's a relational faith. Uh, they've passed that faith down to other people, uh, and their faith, the faith of the early church, is just as precious as the faith of the apostles. Uh, that faith is supposed to lead to a knowledge of God and a knowledge of Jesus. Therefore, the followers of Jesus are to be adding to or supplementing to that faith. It's supposed to increase and go through this progression leading up to love, which is the maturity of faith. Uh, and then they are to grow in knowledge. Knowledge is going to be very, very important over the course of this letter. It already has been in the first nine verses. Uh, so now we're going to jump in and read chapter 1 of 2 Peter, verses 10 through 15, which say this. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things, the words of our Lord. So verse 10 begins with that word, therefore, which shows us that it's connecting and building off of all the thoughts that came before it. So before it, there was this progression of discipleship, this cycle that was going on. Uh, it's there to keep us fruitful and useful in our knowledge of Jesus. So he's flowing out of that idea, following up with that idea. Uh, he says brothers, which in the Greek is the word adolfoi. Um, depending upon your translation, um, adolfoi actually really means, literally means brothers. Uh, a lot of translations, like this 2011 edition of the NIV, say brothers and sisters. And uh, in years past, this has caused quite a stir in the community. Uh, a lot of people will argue, well, technically the words and sisters are not included in the original Greek, and that's true. But that term adolfoi uh, was used in community settings to be inclusive because it was a patriarchal society, uh, because uh, they would often use the, the masculine words or default to the masculine words and mean that to be inclusive of all genders. Uh, technically, this does say brothers and sisters, even though specifically it only says brothers. Um, so sometimes when you're writing it out in Greek yourself, um, you could hyphenate. I used to do that. Uh, brothers hyphen and hyphen sisters or put and sisters in parentheses because the idea is implicit in there, even though it isn't technically in there. Uh, that doesn't seem to be as big of an issue today, but I know it still is for some. So therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort. Uh, that phrase should sound familiar to us. We've heard that phrase already back in verse 5. Uh, it's this idea of um, make every effort to add to your faith. Uh, there's going to be some striving involved in that, some um, some actual discipline involved in that. Uh, and now he says the same thing. Make every effort to confirm your calling and election. Now, interestingly, when we first looked at the chiasm for the structure of 2 Peter, uh, we called that first thematic section A, make every effort to confirm 
your call or your calling. Uh, and this is specifically where that comes from here in verse 10. Uh, the idea of a calling uh, is definitely implied that it's divine. It comes from God. And the idea of election, although we've imported a whole bunch of theology over the centuries into what that word election means, uh, it really just technically means choosing. Uh, so this has been true all throughout the Bible, all throughout the history of the people of God. God has been calling and choosing people, whether that is Noah, whether that is Abraham, whether that is the Apostle Paul or the Apostle Peter, uh, God or Jesus specifically called them and chose them uh, in order to follow him. And it was never for their sake or for their good alone. It was always for the good of the peoples around them and for the good of the world around them. Uh, so Peter says this in his letter, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort, strive, be diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, and I presume that the antecedent to these things is that whole process of confirming your election, I think it goes back to that idea of uh, the precious faith that they have received. It goes back to that idea of having what they need for life and godliness. It goes back to that idea of them needing to escape corruption that's in the world or in the cosmos. Uh, it goes back to that idea of they need to add to or grow into uh, the faith and the knowledge that they have. So if they are doing these things, they will never stumble. And that phrase, never stumble, uh, is fascinating, I think, for its connection back to verse 9, which says, if you don't have these things in increasing measure, uh, all of that cyclical, those eight words, those eight progressions or virtues, um, then you are someone who is nearsighted and blind. And someone who's blind stumbles a lot. They trip, they fall. Uh, the apostle seems to be saying, if you're going to do these things, if you're going to keep your focus on the main thing, which is this call and choosing that you've gotten from God through Jesus, then uh, you will not stumble. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, what is translated as a phrase, you will receive, in the Greek is just one word. It's epikorageo, which is a verb. And that's the same root that's used uh, and translated earlier in this letter as add to. So when they're supposed to add to or supplement these different virtues to their faith, um, it's almost like he's using a play on words now, where he's saying, if you add to or supplement these things, um, then these other things will be supplemented to you. And those things are a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of Jesus. Uh, make no mistake, uh, this is always about kingdom. Uh, the gospel that good news is that God is currently reigning. God has a kingdom. His kingdom is very different than the other kingdoms of this world. Uh, his kingdom will stand and last longer than all of the other kingdoms of the world. It will carry on into the age of ages, which is what is translated here as eternity. Uh, it's an eternal kingdom because it's a kingdom that goes into the next age, into the age to come. So he says, so I will always remind you of these things. Uh, that call to uh, remembrance, to reminding someone, has caused us to recognize over the years that this is probably uh, sharing a lot of similarities to a genre called a testament. A testament is something that's been around for a long time. Uh, it is kind of a farewell discourse. We see it certainly in the Bible, uh, at least as far back as um, Jacob at the end of Genesis. So you have Jacob on his deathbed. Uh, his name obviously has been changed to Israel. He's the prototype for the nation. Uh, he's speaking this farewell address to his 12 sons, who will eventually go on to be the progenitors of the 12 tribes of Israel. And he gives them words of encouragement, 
Uh, he gives them advice. He gives them moral and ethical teaching. And he also gives them uh, a hint at what the horizon is going to look like. There is a bit of prophecy involved in uh, a testament. Now, while it's been used in the Bible, uh, this form, this genre, kind of came to popularity in uh, the Second Temple period. So this would have been right when um, Peter is living. He's living in that te Second Temple period. Um, and it, it was common to have these stories where they would pick a character, a popular character from the First Testament, someone like Moses or Ezra, and they would write a story about them uh, on their deathbed. So they are giving parting words of advice and encouragement. And they would put words into the mouth of these famous historical characters, um, things that they would probably say or things that they already did say. It was just kind of a way to refashion and re-envision um, what that character would have to say to your contemporary center. Now, obviously, um, these in the Second Temple period were all pseudepigraphal. That means the author was anonymous. They purposely picked someone who had been long dead but was famous. Uh, and they wrote and summarized a lot of things that that person already said, or at least things that were in the spirit of that person, uh, in order just to encourage and incite the creative imagination and moral correction of people in their day. There doesn't seem to be any intentional deception behind it. Uh, that was just kind of a, a well-accepted, um, we might call it historical fiction. We just accept it for what it is. There's no harm done, and it does benefit us in some ways. Unfortunately, because of that, that the genre in the Second Temple period is almost entirely pseudepigraphal, that has led many commentators and theologians to believe that Second Peter is also pseudepigraphal, that it probably wasn't written by the apostle himself, uh, but by someone else who was using things that the apostle had said or things that he probably would say in that day. Uh, I certainly don't think you have to believe that, and I guess a healthy counter-argument to that would be if that's a popular genre in the day, it wouldn't be unheard of for someone like the apostle to adapt his own writing to an existing genre in order to best make his point. Uh, even though this is clearly a letter, it has a letter beginning and a letter end, uh, a lot of elements in the body match up with this genre of being a testament. And that's just something we're going to keep pointing out as we move throughout this letter. So, he wants to remind them of these things, even though they know them and are firmly established in the truth that they now have. And he says, I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body. Uh, that is a very interesting euphemism that was common in Greek thought. Uh, Peter didn't invent that. As a matter of fact, we see the Apostle Paul say virtually the same thing in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I might even argue that this is the more popular time that we hear this. Uh, I hear this in funerals, at least in the circles I'm in, all the time. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 says, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. So the Apostle Paul is making the contrast that our earthly bodies are like tents. Tents are temporary. Tents are kind of ramshackle. You can live in them, but you don't want to live in them long term. So he contrasts that idea with a house or a building, something that's a little bit more permanent, something that's supposed to last a little bit longer. And he uses that as the analogy for the heavenly dwelling or even for the resurrection body that is to come. Uh, the Apostle Peter is also noting in his writing that um, his body is like a, a tent. And he says, because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And thanks to the Gospel of John, we have a very specific reference in Scripture of when Peter was told by Jesus uh, that he was going to die. So at the very end of John's Gospel, chapter 21, this is right after um, Jesus asks Peter three times, do you love me? 
Uh, right after that, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And then the author adds this um, editorial insert. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then Jesus said to him, follow me. So the idea seems to be right at the beginning of that apostolic call, that idea of, Peter, I'm going to send you to feed my sheep, to, to be the rock of the church. Peter knows that it's going to end in his death, uh, just like Jesus as the Messiah died. Um, Peter as his apostle and sent one is also going to die in the ministry. And Peter has accepted that. So here in this letter, he says, um, I know that my time is running short, that the tent of this body is going to be put aside, even as Jesus has already made clear to me. And then in verse 15, and I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. The English word departure is actually the Greek word exodus. Uh, so when you think of an exodus, it's a uh, going out from. Uh, clearly, in uh, the second book of Moses, it's the going out from Egypt. Um, but it's often used also as a euphemism for death, going out of this earthly body. Uh, what's interesting is um, both the word tent and the word exodus kind of have a throwback call to uh, Peter's experience on the Mount of Transfiguration. Um, Peter is there along with James and John. Uh, he sees Jesus, and all of a sudden Moses and Elijah, who have long since been dead, appear. And we're told that Peter, who doesn't know exactly what to say, but feels like he should say something, uh, says, Lord, it's good that everybody's here. Uh, we could uh, put up a tent, one for you, one for Elijah, and one for Moses. Uh, so you have this tent language on the Mount of Transfiguration, but we're told actually in Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 31, that um, what Jesus and Moses and Elijah were talking about were about his departure, his exodus, which would soon take place in Jerusalem. So there's all this rich a callback spiritual language to this very incredible revealing of Jesus, at least in the life of the Apostle Peter. And how does all this work together? How do these 15 verses, uh, which we just finished reading, verse 15, uh, function? What are they saying? Well, the Apostle knows that his time is drawing to a close. Uh, he wants to, therefore, remind all of those who are younger than him in the faith, who are maturing in their faith, what is most important. And as far as the apostle sees it, that is growing in faith, that is ensuring their divine calling and God's choosing, and it is receiving the ageless kingdom, keeping the main things the main things. And I think that's something that we should also be doing in our day and age. So that's as far as we're going to go today. Uh, we will prepare our hearts and minds for the next time we delve in to 2 Peter, which will begin in verse 16. Uh, and until then, in our times of isolation, the peace of God.